welcome to uh, the National Growth Areas Alliance Congress for 2019. Um, we are talking about placemaking today and we hope that um, you'll be able to share with us some of your insights into how uh, your government is um, pursuing place and infrastructure and investment in Australia's fast growing cities and suburbs. I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you very much, Bronwyn, and I'm sorry I can't be there in person. And uh, it's Remembrance Day, as everybody knows, and I know you did stop for a minute silence earlier today, but um, it means it's a, it's a big and important day for us in your local electorates. And so I've been at Remembrance Day events over here in Melbourne, so I apologise, can't be there in person. But I think last time I spoke with you, Bronwyn, was uh, in February of this year from memory. Um, and it might have been out in Western Sydney, I think. And, um, and we were just starting to think about our population plans, how we were thinking about infrastructure more generally in relation to that. And since that time, we have fully fleshed out at least the first stages of our population plans and the first stages of um, how we're thinking more about place. And I suppose I'd like to take you through some of those uh, some of that thinking to date and see if we've got time at the end and hopefully we will have time um, just to handle any questions or comments or observations which which people people might have if I can start perhaps by I suppose start on a positive note that if we think about our population and our settlement patterns generally in Australia I would say by and large we've done exceptionally well and we've always been a fast growing nation, as probably many of you know. And we've ticked over at about 1.6% per annum um, since Federation. Sometimes a bit faster, sometimes a bit slower, but that's been our average. And right now we are sitting on 1.6% growth per annum. So exactly on our national, on our long-term average, although obviously off a, a much larger base. And overall those population settings, which we've had over the last 118 years since Federation have served us well. Because by being a fast growing country, and we are double the United States population growth rate, two and a half times the OECD population growth rate average, it's really supported our economic growth and it's made our cities, it's made our um, regions more vibrant, more cosmopolitan, um, but it's particularly important in terms of driving our economic growth in the nation. and. The economists in the room know that population is one of your three P's of economic growth, of population, participation, productivity. They're the three P's to economic growth. And so population is one of those things. But importantly too, because we take people in, into the country when they're younger, average age of about 26 and skilled, then also the population settings support the participation rate in our country as well as the productivity of our country. So overall, it's made us wealthier as a country, but also wealthier per capita. So I suppose the starting point is that we've done, we've done well in terms of our population settings and in terms of our settlement patterns generally. Second point though that I'd probably make is that today, and I think today almost, uh, and over the really the last decade, we've started to see some real challenges emerging from our fast growing population. And um, there's two challenges that I think are, are really, we're really struggling with at the moment, or at least they're, we're grappling with and, and you guys particularly face on the ground in terms of the fast growing regions. And one is that the population growth rates, the population growth is not distributed evenly across the country. As you know, um, three quarters of the entire nation's population growth is into three areas of Australia only. They being Melbourne, my hometown, Sydney and South East Queensland. And those three areas are going like gangbusters. And meanwhile, you've got other parts of Australia though, which frankly are crying out for more people. You've got smaller cities such as in Adelaide or Perth, where you are now, which have quite low population growth. I mean, Perth, the last few years, has been only ticking over at about 1% per annum. Adelaide, about 0.8%, so half the national average. And you've got regional parts of Australia who, who can't get workers for the jobs which are available. So we've got this 
distribution issue nationally, which we're grappling with. On top of that, then the second challenge, I think, is that we've got a distribution issue within our big capital cities. And that's what um, many, well, all of you are facing really both of these, but you see particularly in Melbourne and Sydney, but to some extent in some of the other capital cities as well, we've got um, most of the jobs growth being in the centre of the city, but most of the people growth being in the outer suburbs. And that puts additional um, pressures, therefore, um, on our infrastructure. Because if you've got more and more people living in the outer suburbs, many of the councils which you represent, but they're having to travel further into the cities and already those cities are fast growing, then it really places enormous pressure onto our infrastructure, places enormous pressure in terms of housing approvals, um, keeping up with that population growth, and particularly the housing prices going up in the inner areas particularly, but across the board, um, if it's not keeping up with, with the demand. And we see that in the data. Um, <clears throat> freeway times are slowed. A lot of trains are at crush capacity now in the morning peaks, and we're seeing the, the um, everyday Australians, particularly in those fast growing areas which you represent, really crying out to their political leaders, um, the local mayors and councils, to political leaders like myself, sort of saying, enough, we're just sick and tired of the, the, the congestion pressures and, the, um, and, and the, the battles which we have to face, we don't see any end in sight. So a lot of that's, that's been a very strong sentiment, I think, um, over the last few years. And as I, as I suggest, you guys in some respects are at the coalface of this um, because some of the councils which you represent don't have 2.5% um, growth, which what Melbourne has overall, you've got 35 or 4.5% growth, which you're trying to grapple with. Um, and even in, even in Perth, where you are now, there's some council areas which, um, despite the city only, only growing overall by about 1%, you might have some council areas of Perth, particularly in the southwest, uh, which are growing um, at two or three percent. So it really puts pressure on um, on your ability to manage for that growth. So the third and final sort of point and substantial point then that I'd make is well, how how are we thinking about these challenges and and wanting to work work with you? And that's where we started to outline a a broader population plan, if you like, to start to think about these distribution challenges while maintaining the overall, um, while, while not wanting to, in some respects, not wanting to um, damage the economic growth, because I said at the outset, it's critically important for economic growth, um, but at the same time, recognising the congestion pressures, the housing pressures, which some of the fast growing cities and some of the fast growing areas are really facing. First thing we've actually done is slightly slowed down the migration rate. And we reduced the migration rate from 100, 190,000 per annum, that's the permanent migration rate, down to 160,000 cap. And that's important because migration is 60% of our population growth. So if you want to just ease up slightly on the population growth rate, you have to tackle migration. So we've dropped that down. Within the 160,000 cap, we've then allocated 25,000 positions specifically for the smaller cities and the regions. And so, and that is deliberately designed, the combination of those two to take a little bit of the heat out of the Melbourne and Sydney and Southeast Queensland and support the growth aspirations of an Adelaide or some of the regional areas or a Darwin or elsewhere, which are desiring to grow faster. We've also still within the migration settings, looked at the temporary migration um, settings. And for those who know the, the complexities of a, of a migration system, temporary migration is actually as important as permanent migration in terms of the overall numbers. And the largest category there is in fact international students, which makes up 43% of the overall net overseas migration figure. We have also introduced incentives for international students 
to um, study in an Adelaide or a Perth or a regional area, rather than what presently occurs is 80% of them go to Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane. So again, I think that's going to be an important incentive just to take a little bit of the heat out of uh, Melbourne, Sydney and, and Brisbane. On top of that, and this will be in alignment, and this is a medium term play, we've articulated a fast rail plan, which is um, with, our, with our aspiration there being to, to connect up some of the satellite cities from Melbourne and Sydney particularly, and Brisbane, um, to fast rail, which will then enable people to live and work in that regional satellite centre, um, but still commute in a very rapid, convenient uh, way into the large employment markets on a daily basis. So we've articulated our ambitions there. We've set up a fast rail agency and we've put serious dollars on the table for the very first one to get going. And that is the Geelong fast rail, Melbourne to Geelong, as well as then got studies underway for the other ones, which will inform our future priorities. So in on a strategic level, I think the combination of those migration settings plus the fast rail plan really will get that better distribution overall um, of our population growth. So we haven't got quite as much heat into Melbourne and Sydney um, and into South East Queensland. Then the second element, if you like, of that overall plan, you've got that strategic element just there, which I've articulated. You've then got the second element, which is really a massive increase in infrastructure overall. Um, now, the states have also increased their infrastructure expenditure, particularly Melbourne and Sydney, particularly Victoria and New South Wales, um, but we have particularly done so just in this year's budget, increased our pipeline from $73 billion up to $100 billion um, of infrastructure. And critically importantly as well, particularly to, to local councils in these fast growing areas, is that we have lent in heavily in terms of smaller scale projects as much as the larger scale ones. And many of those are working in partnership with you. Um, under our Urban Congestion Fund project, I certainly know um, across across Melbourne, across Sydney, across Brisbane, and even, even across many of the suburbs of Perth um, to support those smaller scale projects, as well as things like community car parks, which have become so critical to facilitate people jumping onto the trains rather than onto, uh, rather than automatically into their cars. And then finally, in terms of our plan, if you like, having gone through that strategic element, talk briefly about this infrastructure plan. The third element is, is instituting and putting in place better planning mechanisms with the states and territories in particular, but also the local councils. And doing that through what we call a national population planning framework, which is specifically designed to better align our population um, settings with the infrastructure and housing approval settings in particular. Because as you probably know, the peculiarity of our federation is that we control the major population growth lever being the migration settings, but the states and territories and local councils have the primary responsibility for the infrastructure and housing approvals and service delivery. And those two things aren't always aligned. And so our, pop, our um, population planning framework supported by a new centre for population um, in Treasury in Canberra is designed to align those things much more tightly to do better forecasting, do better data integration, provide better analysis um, for states, for councils as well, so that we can all be on the same, um, ideally on exactly the same um, page when it comes to population growth, where it's going, what our forecasts are, and being able to track against that to try to hit those forecasts as much as possible and with the infrastructure keeping pace with that population growth. So that becomes a critical component as well. And city deals largely fall within, within that in terms of aligning the three levels of government as well, but obviously in a geographically focused, focused way. So that's, if you like, our, our thinking at the moment in terms of, or I should say our, our, our policy thinking, um, which we've already done a lot of and which there'll be more to come in terms of the big strategic settings through the migration system, through our fast rail plan, through a massive injection in infrastructure and particularly local infrastructure. Um, and thirdly, this planning mechanism so that we can align uh, 
the settings much more closely and better able to manage and plan accordingly. Um, there's a lot of work to do in this space, and uh, this this is this is an, a, a, an evolving. Um, um, we've already done a lot of work, but there's still much more work to, to do. Our centre for population is only just really hitting its straps now. It'll be at full capacity by the end of the year, um, and obviously want to involve. Um, all levels of governments in this process as well as we go forward. So I might leave it there, Brian, in terms of um, uh, at least an overarching view of our thinking and, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And uh, how wonderful that, that technology seems to have lasted. <laughs> It is. I'm literally just speaking into a little laptop here in my um, in my lectured office. So I'm just I'm blown away that actually it's not even connected to anything. Okay, I'll open <laughs> open to the floor to questions, and if if um, you could just make sure that you introduce yourself so that um, um, and there's a camera at the back of the room if you'd like to um, make um, virtual eye contact. Um, <laughs> any questions? Um, I'll, I'll kick I'll kick one off then, um, and it's around, uh, and I know we've spoken about this before, Minister. It's around the urban congestion fund, and um, the importance of a fund like that in addressing some of those pinch points and and those really um, troublesome areas, especially in suburban areas, and especially in those areas where the pinch point has occurred because usage of that road has just um, increased at an exponential rate. So um, I know there have been a lot of projects funded. Um, can you tell us your thinking about the future of that and how we can sort of perhaps help influence some of those decisions around accessing those funds? Yeah, that, it's a good question. So the, the fund is, is $4 billion um, in terms of the urban congestion fund, then we've probably allocated or made decisions in relation to about $3 billion of that. And most of those decisions were made through a combination um, really of, of, of two or three things. Obviously, the analysis which has been done by our federal department who have some of the transport modelling analysis, um, some of the representations made by the state governments and they were all consulted in relation to it, as well as obviously political leaders, including members of parliament. Um, all coming together before decisions were made in relation to that fund. And our leaning in on this was really recognition that um, a lot of these larger scale projects take three, five, sometimes 10 years to complete. Um, and in the meantime, though, uh, the, the congestion is, is building up. And so if we can assist in terms of addressing some of those bottlenecks and make a difference to people's lives, uh, immediately or within a two or three years, um, while the larger scale projects are being done, then that can help facilitate um, commuters on a daily basis and obviously helps the productivity of the economy as well for tradies and transport and things to be able to get around. Now, the um, most of the, the remaining billion dollars is, um, is still slightly outside the forward estimates. Um, but there may well be decisions made in the future. I'm, I'm not foreshadowing any here, Bron, um, but I get representation still all the time, um, as I'm sure many of you have already made representations to your local member or, um, or the like, and we'll still be considering those in the future. Thank you. Questions from the floor? Jeez, if you've got the uh, after lunch, <laughs> Well, everyone's a bit sort of sleepy, are they? <laughs> a little one. Here, here's one over here. Uh, Phil Harrison, City of Playford, Minister for Tudge. I just wanted to ask about the relationship between your portfolio responsibility for urban infrastructure and Deputy Prime Minister McCormack's responsibility for infrastructure. Yeah, so both of us, so he and I work very closely together. He's the Deputy Prime Minister and um, and deals with all the regional infrastructure while I deal with the urban infrastructure and have obviously the population and cities portfolio as well. So um, sometimes there's a little bit of a grey area on the margins, but typically we work this out 
very effectively and we work together very closely. Both of us are in cabinet. Um, I'm sworn into treasury as well. So I have that responsibility because the population settings are done out of treasury um, as well as the infrastructure portfolio. So I guess the question that, that the bottom line is um, you can work through both of us um, and we'll, we'll sort it out internally if there's any ambiguity. Thank you. Okay, another question from the floor. Hi, Minister. I'm Kelly Grigsby, the CEO of Wyndham City Council. I'm interested in your government's view on the innovation clusters, the national employment clusters, and where your policy thinking's at in that regard, um, particularly drawing on some of the comments that you made earlier about one of the biggest challenges for Australia is, of course, distribution around population growth. Um, versus jobs growth. So I'm just interested in sort of what your commitment is around those innovation clusters, those national employment precincts, and how you see them making a difference moving forward. Yep, I think they can make a difference and are making a difference. I don't, I'm not across the detail in terms of um, exactly where they are and how much more is going to be done. Um, I will say just in terms of, because I mentioned that sort of internal distribution issue where um, still, the majority of the um, employment growth is in the inner areas, but the majority of the housing growth and the people growth is in the outer suburbs, typically, which the, the, the councils that you represent. We're starting to do this better, I think, particularly in Sydney, actually. And Sydney, through the Greater Sydney Commission and led by the Premier, has identified, as you probably know, um, three areas, or almost for Sydney to, be, Sydney to become three cities within one city. The CBD, the area around Parramatta being in a west, and then the um, and, and then Western Sydney Parkland, and we're working very closely with uh, the New South Wales government on through our Western Sydney city deal, and also through the development of the Western Sydney Airport, effectively to create uh, places in Western Sydney where people can live, work, and play all in the one area. And we're very focused in that regard in, on the employment side of things in terms of um, attracting large scale employers to the area. And we've been successful at that. Now, when you're developing an international airport, that, that does attract um, big companies who want to be co who want to be located nearby. Um, so it's helped by that. But there is a deliberate effort by the federal government and the state government and the eight local councils that we're working with. Um, to achieve that end. And if we get that right, which we, I think we are getting right, then that obviously takes pressure off the infrastructure so that people don't have to commute um, further into town. I think in relation to, to Melbourne, where I know you're from, um, the, the state government hasn't had that, as, hasn't had that type of plan that Sydney has in terms of the three cities policy. Um, areas, but it does have a number of areas, as you probably know, which are sort of um, employment cluster areas, and they're sometimes supported by our by our innovation um, um, employment centres as well. Um, but I still think it's an ongoing challenge for us um, here in here in Melbourne, actually. Um, and I think perhaps some of the greatest challenges are actually here in Melbourne because it's the the city which has been growing the fastest about two and a half percent per annum for a decade now of a very large base and where the infrastructure is probably a decade behind maybe 15 or 20 years behind so i think we've got some real challenges here in melbourne with no um no simple solutions you know there's a big infrastructure program underway there is a lot of effort going on but there's no um overnight solutions to some of our challenges here and one last one one last question. Hi, Minister. Rachel Paggetts from Penrith City Council. Uh, of course, thank you for urban congestion funding of around 120 million, so thank you. Um, in relation to that funding, I just had a question, and it's great to see the federal government is leaning in there um, in funding and supporting the New South Wales government. Does the next iteration of that fund or future work on that fund look like um, or look at addressing that last mile and getting people out of cars? Because in our city, we're getting... Uh, some new commuter car parking, which of course still means people are getting into their cars to get there. We very much need that commuter car parking, but we want to change behaviours. So is there a second phase or future thinking that will address that? It's a, it's a, it's a really good question. I get asked this a lot. I think that 
the commuter car parks are desperately necessary and they do help obviously get people out of their cars and onto the rail network and that was part of the intent and because as you know um, in many parts of Sydney and many parts of Melbourne indeed other parts of the country many of the commuter car parks are full by seven o'clock and what does that mean that means that people then either park um, illegally or they drive onto the next station that could be full they drive onto the next one and then they might give up and just add traffic so our policy here um, we think could take anywhere up to 25,000 cars off the road um, by enabling um, faster facilitation of commuter car parks. So I think it is important, and I know you acknowledge that. Um, the last mile is always the, the, the one of the trickiest parts of an overall planning system. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of technology which is emerging there. I know state governments typically now are thinking more carefully as our local councils around putting more densification around um, uh, transport corridors. So it diminishes that last mile. We've got more people who can walk or take an easy, you know, bike ride or the like um, to get to the train station to be able to get into work. Um, we're still always going to have the problem though with people like the tradies or people who uh, maybe they've got kids and they're dropping their kids off to school and then they're going somewhere else and doing the shopping. And so this, the, the, car, the motor car is still going to be a very important part of daily life, I think, and particularly so in the suburbs. I mean, I think the, um, the Grattan Institute has done some interesting work actually showing um, the, the, the dependence on cars, particularly in the outer suburbs actually is higher than it is in, in other parts. And in some respects that makes sense. Um, who knows where technology is going to take us in the future? Um, we're doing some thinking about it. We're funding things. Um, automotive vehicles are on the horizon. Who knows when, though? Um, you've got other things which other companies are introducing, things like the, you know, the Lime bikes and the Lime scooters, so the shared platforms that people might be able to use for the last mile. But I still think there's a lot of thinking which needs to be done and a lot of emerge emerging technology. Very good. Um, thank you very much, Minister. I, I think our time is up. So um, please, a round of applause for Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. And um, sorry again that I couldn't be there in person. That's quite OK. And we really appreciate your ongoing support. We've talked a lot today about the importance of collaboration, both uh, between the three levels of government. But I think what's just as important is within each level of government. So we're working really hard, especially through the city deal process, to, to, um, to do that collaboration. And we just um, yeah, encourage your continued leadership in that city deal model to really get all of the government departments on side and, and on the same page. Well, thank you, Bron. And um, I'm, I'm sort of acutely aware of some of the issues which your members face, I, I, I suppose, having grown up and lived pretty much all my life in in the outer suburbs and um, and in very very fast growing areas. Um, you know the Cardinia where I grew up and and now in Knox, which is a fast growing area in the outer suburbs of, of Melbourne. So I I feel what you're going through and and thank you for all the work which you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister.